Welcome to yet another episode of the Let's Talk Leadership podcast. This is a show where I, Ellie, MD of Transition Partners and the CEO, Sandra, talk to some of the world's highest achieving business and tech leaders. In each episode, we will be sharing tales, tips, techniques and war stories in the hope that you will learn from some of these amazing leaders to help you develop and progress your career. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Let's Talk Leadership podcast. I am super excited today to be catching up with a very friendly guest on the show. We've got Jeff Glasson, who is the VP of Engineering at Contentful. Before his move to Berlin to lead engineering at Contentful, the market-leading content platform for enterprises, Jeff was a career Silicon Valley engineer and leader. Starting as a software engineer at HP, he spent time at top Valley companies, including software development roles at Apple and Next, and tech leadership roles at Apple, VMware, and Cloudera, working on everything from operating systems to big data to end user cloud services. Jeff has a breadth of experience to draw on today. When not building world-class engineering organizations, Jeff spends his time with his family, traveling, skiing, and enjoying life. So hello, Jeff. Yeah. Hello, nice to chat. Hi, we're so happy to have you here today. So you're telling me it's minus 10 in Berlin this morning. It is minus 10 and snowing, uh, a little bit different than wow. California. That's minus 10 Celsius, just to be clear. Yeah, are you from California originally? I am not. Originally, I was born in Chicago. So Okay, I so you're used to the cold, cold weather then. Yeah. Chicago gets really cold, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Not like me then, I'm a bit of a sun worshipper. So to me, the thought of minus 10. <laughs> I actually don't think I've ever been that cold in my life. I went to, um, oh, we went to Budapest in a year once and it was minus six and that was just too much for me. And I thought then, no, I don't think I can do that cold again. So uh, <laughs> certainly a very cold start to your morning. Have you been outside or are you staying tucked in all day? Uh, well, you know, we're still COVID locked down here, so. The weather is not too bad. Um, I did open the door to my terrace to see how cold it was, and it was cold. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a nice way to wake yourself up in the morning, isn't yeah. it? Just minus 10. Lovely. Good stuff. So obviously doing an intro there, you've worked some really amazing, incredible organizations, which we can't wait to hear more about. We always like to start the podcast with you telling us about your journey and how you got to where you are today. So let's go way back and what led you to this path and, and, and contentful. Today. Well, it's a long, it's a long journey. So, um, uh, growing, growing up, I was always into computers and tech. Um, my dad was an electrical engineer, and I, um, we built homebrew computers back when that was a thing to do in the seventies and eighties. And um, I started programming um, when I was a teenager, um, and I knew from that point on that's what I wanted to do for my career. So I went to university, got a CS degree. Um, and then ended up at Hewlett Packard out of out of college um, as an engineer uh, in their operating system group, and so amazing learned a lot there. Um, spent about seven years there before I decided to go to the consumer space and worked at Apple as an engineer at first. Um, I left Apple a couple of years after that and went. So what and that followed. was back in like the eighties then? This was well, the early 90s. early nineties now. Oh, what an amazing time to be at Apple. It was interesting. It was not the best time, but Steve had really? already been fired. Um, there was a leadership. Um, I ended up leaving Apple in 94 and following Steve to Next. Wow. Um, and was hired there to do the same type of work I'd been doing at HP, actually. We were porting an operating system um, to HP and Sun workstations, and I was hired to do that. Um, I like to say it next, I got tricked into becoming a manager. Um, I was tech lead for a group and my manager left and the VP said, hey, do you want to manage the team? I said, how's my life going to change? And he said, eh, not much, except you'll rewrite reviews once a year, but nothing else will change. And I kind of naively <laughs> said, really? okay. Um, and so um, that stuck um, when we got bought by Apple, I went back to Apple um, and as a manager um, and uh, moved into a senior manager position with a big group of 30 to 40 people um, doing developer tools. Um, 
Awesome. And after a, a while at Apple, I decided it was time to try something new. And I went to VMware when it was about a thousand people. So it was still not huge. Um, spent a long time there, um, moved up the management chains, did bigger and bigger things. At one point I was managing over 300 people there. Wow. Um, and it was 20,000 people when I left. So I saw a lot of growth, a lot of change. Um, and then when, after about 11 years, I decided it, I was too comfortable um, and decided I wanted to go smaller again and ended up at Cloudera, mostly on a uh, reference of someone who used to work for me at VMware that went to Cloudera early, was their CTO, ended up deciding to go on sabbatical and said, you can have your job, but it'll be a VP of engineering job there. And wow. so I was there for a little while. Um, we went through some mergers, things changed. I decided it wasn't for me anymore. And now I'm in Berlin. Um, and I wasn't looking to move to Berlin. Yeah. I was looking for the right job and it just happened to be in Berlin. Um, oh my gosh. So how long have you been in Berlin for now? A little over a year and a half now. And you moved the family as well? Um, my kids are in university. Uh, okay. My wife and I moved. Um, mm -hmm. And it was traumatic. Um, we moved and sold our house and tried to buy a new house in California to keep a small house. And my son was moving to school in Colorado. It was a very hectic time. Wow. Um, but um, here we are. Um, it was tough. Um, my parents and her mom are still in California and my kids are there. Um, mm -hmm. Our friends are there, and with COVID, it's very hard to see them in person. Yeah, of course it is. Like, what a year! Normally, I guess you'd probably plan to go home multiple times, multiple times throughout the year, but obviously the past. It was originally was planned quarterly to go back and spend a week or two there. Um, it was nice because Contentful has a San Francisco office, so Great. we're in San Francisco and Berlin, and now Denver. We're building a third office, but mm -hmm. um, that was the plan. Um, but things changed. What a journey, like, oh my gosh, you work with some incredible <laughs> brands and it sounds like you've um, like you've been there really in the mix of creating some world-class cultures as well and in working environments. So um, yeah, I'm really excited to find out more about your leadership journey today. It's gonna be a very interesting. You've got that huge impressive background, big brands, um, and obviously now across to, Berlin what do you think then do you think what do you think may help make you successful and what advice would you be offering to those looking to follow your footsteps in the future uh me becoming an expat or just in general about in leadership? general like that's that career is just amazing I, I mean I think I think the biggest thing is as I've always believed that is as a leader and I'll, and I'll try to distinguish between being a manager and being a leader um, a leader is someone who manages, but it's also someone who people want to follow, whereas a manager kind of just tells people what to do. So that's my distinction in my language. Um, so I think the most important thing about becoming a good, effective leader is trust. And you really need to get that trust thing down with your team. Yeah. Um, and it's hard. I think the hardest thing I did, I think there were two hard transitions during my career. One was when I realized I was a manager after I was kind of, as I said, tricked into it. Yeah. Um, but once I started taking on bigger teams, you know, when I first became a manager, I was this, and I was like this player coach where I was still playing engineer and writing code and contributing mm -hmm. and managing. Um, quickly, I realized as my team grew that it's hard to put yourself on the critical path because there's other things a manager needs to do. Um, so even at Apple, I was still keeping my hands dirty. Um, and this was way back when you were just meant to be doing one report a year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's a big difference. But I was like, I was the one man <laughs> test team for our 64 bit ABI when I was in the compiler team. So I tried to stay technical and hands on. Um, yeah. But I think the big thing, getting back to this transition, the hardest thing for a lot of people that make this transition from engineer to manager is the faith thing. It's really realizing that you can't do everything anymore. Your job is to make the people who work for you the most productive and happy and best they can be. And you have to be the one that pushes yourself out of your comfort zone to be what's best for each of them. Mm -hmm. um, 
the next step I think is what would hit me is when I started taking on big teams and I, and I hesitated for a really long time. I wanted to stay kind of very technical and keep small teams, but once you pass about that 50, 60 person level, you don't really know what everybody is doing who works for you yeah. anymore. Yeah. And that, that must be quite hard because you go, you know, obviously I don't want to use the word control, but you know, you, you, you've got a good idea of what's going on in your pack. Right. But when you get to that 60, 70 people, like you say, taking that next step into leadership, you kind of lose that, don't you? That must be quite a difficult. You do, and that, that, that just amplifies the need for trust, right? Yeah. And faith, right? Because now you're not it's even... interesting you using the word faith, because I've never had anyone use that before in leadership. Okay. But I really like that. Like, I really, I, I agree with that. And it's a, trust, it sounds like the, like, easiest thing in the world, doesn't it? But it's just so difficult to be able to yeah. balance that. And it's hard to earn and really easy to lose, too. So, yeah, so I definitely agree. Who's the most inspiring leader you've ever worked for, then? Wow. Um, someone might expect me to say Steve Jobs, but I, yeah. I won't. Um, he's inspiring in different ways, but I, I think probably um, the person that I probably learned the most from on my mm -hmm. management style is someone I had very early in my career. Um, at HP. Um, he was an incredibly smart, empathetic, passionate person about what he did. Um, he was also came up during the time when, and now it's starting again, but he, he wasn't an engineer by trade. He could think he had a BA in English and then decided he wanted to get into programming and taught himself programming. And back then, you know, in the, in the early 80s, you were able to get into a tech company um, without a computer science degree. That's changing again now. I know Google and some other companies have really said college degrees aren't important, but for about the last 25 years, it was very difficult. So mm. he taught me a lot about what to do. Um, I think the other thing, and I won't, I won't name names, but I also have learned a lot. And I, I guess it's weird to say that they've been inspirational to me, but I've had a couple incredibly bad managers in my career. Mm. And they were very inspirational in that they taught me exactly what not to do. Yeah. Um, because I, I think it's really formed my, my credo of, you know, treat people the way you want to be treated and treat people as responsible adults until they prove they can't be. Yeah. And um, it's amazing how many managers and leaders just want to come in and exert control and kind of turn things into what they want versus what may be best for the organization. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. So, and who was the leader, sorry, at HP then? The name of the person that you- Oh, knew? I bet no one would remember. His name was, uh, well, no, I don't want to name names. I'm not going to name is. names. I don't okay. want to call people. Well, it's like. nice to know that someone at the start of your career had such yeah. like a, a crucial inspiration on your leadership journey. And like you say, interesting how you say, around the bad managers that, you, that you've come across in your experience. Because I was on a um, podcast recording with um, a CPO in Berlin, actually called Christina last week. And she was saying how like, if ever she's had a bad manager, she would leave and she'd work for someone else. She wouldn't want to work. But it is interesting that you actually gain sometimes when things go wrong in life or you're on that journey that you learn a hell of a lot more than when things go right don't you because you pick up on things quickly so. well you do but you don't want to stay for long right i mean you're yeah. right i mean it's like you know people say you don't quit a job you quit a manager and i really believe that so. yeah, i agree what about um your leadership style then you said there's a lot of trust a lot of faith in your team how else would you describe it and how would they describe you as a leader at contempo um I think there is, uh, trust is a basis of this, but I really do believe in empowering the team. Um, yeah. I, I am very transparent. I let people know. In fact, I kind of going on the treating people like responsible adults theme, I will be very open and transparent with information. If people hold it in confidence, that's great. If they don't, I have to act differently, but people really respect that I am genuine and transparent with, with, with what, I expect what they're doing and what we want to do as a company. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I call it trust but verify management, kind of going back to an old political term. Um, mm -hmm. But I do really kind of trust people to do the right thing. And I watch and I monitor and I don't get in people's ways unless something is going off track and things need to be fixed. Yeah, of course. 
What about on that leadership journey? Is there any real sort of poignant moments that you got your biggest lessons as a leader that you can talk about today? So it's interesting to hear like when something went really wrong or how you kind of approached that. I, I think the biggest one that, that comes to mind right away is, is right after I became a VP at VMware um, and I liked to play act engineer every now and then. Um, I bumped into one of the senior engineers in the hallway and just started having a conversation. And I'm like, oh, let's talk tech and let's talk about this project you're working on. Yeah. And um, I walked away saying, well, that was a fun 20 minutes of me pretending to be an engineer again. That person walked away with the big boss just told me to do something different. And I, the big learning of that was people people care about titles and respect titles sometimes. And people are, you know, my word carried a lot of weight. And it really hit me that things I say get taken very differently than when I was a VP than when I was an engineer. And yeah. setting context for those types of kind of brainstorming sessions I learned is extremely important. So now if I still do them, and I still do them once in a while, I will be very clear up front and say, look, this is not me as your boss. This is me as kind of just having a talk and brainstorming. And it, and it seems to still work. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really good. Like you say, you're just, it is actually a bit of fun for you, isn't it? To go back to those roots and enjoy that tech conversation. So that's awesome. Um, how, how big is your team currently then? Um, Tell us about your current role and what, you're, what you've been up so to. So we are growing like crazy. Um, which is one reason I came to Contentful. Um, there is a massive opportunity for us. Uh, when I joined 18, 19 months ago, we were at about 250 people in the company. And uh, the engineering group was about 40 people. Okay. Um, we are now at close to 100 in engineering. Um, with plans to grow by another 50 or so for the rest of this year and more beyond. Um, but we are, we are riding the rocket ship. Um, we are blessed to have a great product market fit and a huge market. Um, our market is digital content on the internet. It's a pretty big market. <laughs> and and um, COVID was scary at first. We didn't know how our customers were going to react to it. Um, so we got really conservative at the beginning of the pandemic. But I had always thought, if people can't go into physical retail stores, the answer is digital experiences. I guess if the retailers who are our customers go out of business, that's bad for us. But otherwise, they're going to give us more money um, and accelerate that digitization of, of things. And um, we probably had a hiccup of about a month or two where everyone was trying to figure out what was going on at the end of 2020. We pretty much hit our original pre-pandemic plan. So we're doing awesome. We managed to raise a pile of money during the pandemic. Um, awesome. We did a big fundraise in the spring of last year. Um, so we are really well positioned for growth. And I guess one of the challenges I see going forward for us is we are really in that kind of awkward teenage years of a, of a company. And we're really trying to make that transition from startup to scale up right now. And it's, yeah. it's, it's stressful for a lot of different reasons. Of course. It's, so what percentage of the team is in Berlin? And you said, obviously you mentioned San Fran, Colorado, you're going to grow a team. Over so there. the engineering team's a hundred percent in Berlin, okay. um, which was refreshing compared mm -hmm. to me flying all over the world, managing a global team on three or four continents um, okay. before. Um, so we're all here. We're all in the same time zone. Um, before COVID, we were all in the workplace. We were a very office-centric um, yeah. engineering group. Mm -hmm. um, we've obviously made some adjustments in the last nine months. And post-pandemic will be more flexible, but we still will have an office and we'll still expect people to be in the office at regular times regular yeah. period maybe a day a week or something like that to oh, yeah. sync up so you can keep in touch so barely yeah. still going to be big. okay tell us then about tips from you then about that that taking from startup to scale up obviously you've grown some huge teams before talent is most people's biggest pain point isn't it in in terms of in, in our industry and finding the right people and building out the right teams have you got any tip great tips that you've found along the way around like talent attraction um i think branding 
company branding for engineers is important. I think it's that's very different than your product branding in the marketplace. You really need to create um, a brand on what a great place you are to work, um, which means company culture is important. Um, we have done a pretty good job um, with name recognition in Berlin. We are one of the high-flying startups, scale-ups, depending what word you want to use this week. Um, <laughs> but we, there's a few, but we're kind of people, if you're, if you're an engineer in the Berlin scene, you've heard of us, whether or not you know anything about content management. Um, and so that helps us. Um, I think the other thing that is important is to really create and attract, to attract the best people, you really need to create an environment where people are excited about solving hard problems. And you really need to make them understand what the problems are, how it fits, how the customer benefits from it, how they can contribute. And um, it's not that hard to attract the people, I would say. Mm -hmm. I think what I think the challenge is going to be throughout 2021, at least, as we grow so much, right? Our culture is changing. It has to change as, as we get bigger. Um, and so the challenge to keep the longer term senior people who joined a small startup um, is really how do you keep them feeling like they have a voice and can influence as much. And obviously mm -hmm. they're not gonna be in every meeting and be part of every decision directly like they were when it was 10 engineers in the company, but mm -hmm. you need to create mechanisms for people to provide input and make sure they feel that they're listened to. Yeah, that value that they bring. Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? And it's so competitive in Berlin, isn't it? Like you said, there's new new companies popping up all the time with amazing opportunities. Very similar, I guess, Silicon Valley must have been the same all the time that your your staff were being approached about other opportunities. So keeping them engaged and excited and giving them a bit of creative license sounds like a good way, good way to definitely do that. What about you personally then? Obviously you've been, been in the game a while. You've, you've got some um, amazing experiences that you've gone, but what really gets you up in the morning now? What get, what are you passionate about in tech? I mean, I, I still love building things that, that make people's lives better. Um, I think that's been a key part of all the jobs I've been happiest at in my career is it's really delivering product that is a great product that people love to use. Um, I think people, when I when I moved from Apple to VMware, people were like, well, how are you going to get, people never heard of VMware, right? It was enterprise software. It was this virtualization yeah. infrastructure. It's really easy to explain when you work at Apple what you do um, to people. But still, yeah. um, it really is about building something that helps people people's lives be better. And it, it sounds mm -hmm. sort of cheesy, but it really is about making people's days better. Um, and so that's what I've always loved to do. I've never been a huge fan or excited. I mean, it's important, but I've never been super excited about doing research for research's sake. It's really about let's investigate bleeding edge tech and build a product about it and sell it to people. Yeah, that's amazing. Good stuff. What about um, like the past year, like, like you said, the past 18, 19 months have been extremely challenging and I guess disrupting for you personally obviously relocating to Berlin um, moving your, your wife across being away from family and then COVID hits how have you have you got any top tips around like how you you've not united your teams motivated them during times of like real change um yeah it's been hard and I think you know we we've actually we actually ironically did a trial of a disaster of what happens if we couldn't go to the office. This was, I think, in February. No so, way. February of 2020. Um, yeah, wow. We said, what happened? And I, I guess COVID had already started, so we kind of yeah. wanted to try it. And I think, what happens if it gets really bad and we can't go to the office? So we, we actually did a little experiment and said on the night before, they said, sorry, the office is closed tomorrow, but you still have to work and figure it out. Um, which we didn't want to give a lot of notice to people so it would mm -hmm. simulate a real emergency. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, it was interesting how people really adapted, right? We had already had, you know, 
was, well, we were, were we using Zoom or was it Google Hangouts then? I don't remember. Mm. Um, but we already had video conferencing. We already had ways to communicate. We were using Slack and email. Um, and so we had all of the digital tools already. Mm. Um, and so it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. But when we decided to close the office when COVID got bad, and yeah. we were pretty early on um, compared to other Berlin companies, um, we, we actually have not really been in the office since last March. Yeah. Um, with a short period of when things between the waves got better, we opened the office up for a very select few who had some hardship cases of not really having a place to work or they were three people in a 50 square meter apartment all trying to work from home and so they couldn't oh, be gosh. productive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but we're, we really started doing some virtual team building things. We were holding like Zoom happy hours on Friday evenings. Um, the, we have we use Donut, which is a tool that like you can just click and Slack, and it will randomly set up a coffee meeting with someone in the company who you may or may not know. So you can meet That's people nice. that way. Um, yeah, lots of team building virtual things like trivia nights, game nights. Um, there's enough online board game platforms now that you can still have some sort of connectivity. Um, mm. And it's hard. I know it's hard for like we've hired and onboarded a lot of people since yeah. we've been, and that's I think the hardest for is is those people who haven't actually ever met the people face to face that they're working with now. Yeah, and harboring that culture is really tough, isn't it? When you're yeah. growing and changing, and and when you go through the numbers that you're reaching now, it does change the culture a lot. So to be able to do that remotely is 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 certainly very tough. What about yourself then personally, Jeff? How do you sort of keep yourself sane, healthy? How have you done over the years, like managing the stress of everything? You, I'm sure you've been under huge, immense pressures in the past, but any tips? It's always somewhere that we like to be able to share with our audience, I guess, ideas and ways to manage the stress. I mean, I think you need to take breaks. Um, you know, I know there are times where it's 120, 150% effort for weeks or months at a time, um, but you can't do that forever without burning out. And so you need to take breaks. Um, I usually ski in the winters a lot, um, not for the last two winters because of COVID. Um, but when I lived in California, I spent a lot of weekends in Lake Tahoe. Um, skiing in the winter that actually was my exercise was the three months during the year of skiing I didn't do a lot of real exercise during the year um, now here when the weather's nicer Berlin's a great bike friendly city it's flat it's green there's lots of parks and lakes so lots of bike riding around the city plus it's a great way to get to learn a new city yeah um, and so lots of bike rides um, lots of train trips to villages around um, just kind of spend the weekend outside I mean, it'd be nice for you, I guess, this year, the past year, you've probably not been able to see as much of Europe as you were hoping when you first initially moved across, right? You were probably like, I'll just come to Berlin, settle in for a couple of months, and then we'll go on all these great trips all over Europe. But unfortunately, it's that, that was one of the selling points that I made to my wife was, hey, we're an hour <laughs> plane ride from lots of places for weekend trips. And guess what? When we get there, we're not jet lagged. So um, we did a little of that at the beginning. Um, yeah. But yeah, hopefully by the summer we'll be able to. What's on the list then? Where are you going to go next? Um, well, we had a trip to Bali planned last fall that. Oh wow! Happen, um, but that's not Europe. Um, I think we we love London, um, though now it's very problematic because my wife and I are big theater people, um, yeah. and so we did one or two trips to London before the pandemic for for seeing some plays. Um, been around Germany is the easiest thing right now. Germany is a pretty big country with a lot of nice places to visit. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, the Balkans are nice. Um, it'd be nice to get back to the Mediterranean coast where it's warmer. Oh, don't we all want to be back on the Mediterranean coast? Particularly <laughs> on a day when it's minus 10. I can imagine you're really feeling that one today. What about... Um, your involvement in tech communities, I mean, probably this is probably more going back to what prior to COVID, back at when, when we talk about your time in San Fran, what was that involvement like, conferences, events, is there anything that you feel you'd be worth telling the audience about? Um, I mean, I mean, back then I used to, I used to go, I used to like giving presentations at conferences. I used to do it at Apple. Apple has their internal worldwide development co- developer conference and I 
used to do one or two presentations a year at that, which was always kind of fun, scary and fun, right? I'm not yeah. a great public speaker. I really get freaked out, um, but everyone says it came out okay afterwards, so that's good. <laughs> um, I uh, There's a lot of great organizations out there, um, and I think the ones, you kind of have to pick what works for you, and it's kind of like management books right there's a lot of great management books out there you got to find one that resonates with you and then kind of apply it um but i think the ones the groups that i really got the most of in in the bay area um was um either the technical conferences where um you get together you know with like-minded people in the same area of tech and there's a lot of them um it depends what you're working on um there aren't any really bad ones, though I think the value of those is mostly the networking, not actually the contact, the actual content of the seminars. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that was really helpful to me as I made my journey as a leader was um, I joined a peer learning group, um, mm -hmm. which was a bunch of VPEs um, from different companies um, mm -hmm. that we actually got matched. So we were complimentary and we met once a month for dinner um, and talked things out. It was a very safe space. It was really nice to be able to go and talk about the problems that you're having in your current job and be able to hear from a neutral outsider some different ideas on how to solve those problems. So that was very, very helpful to me. Um, There's so much value in that, isn't there? And it's just, yeah. everyone's going through the same troubles. You always feel a bit like you're on your own and isolated. Yeah. But it's just it might be slightly different, but it's all on the same same journey and same story. So it's really interesting to be able to kind of put it out there and discuss and get ideas. And I'm sure that you gained loads of value from that. Yeah, I actually missed that. I'm trying to see if there's some replacement in Berlin, though I hear there's some starting up um, some similar things, um, yeah. which would be great. Mm -hmm. I'd love to be part of those again. That's really great. And what about books that you mentioned there? Is there any like real good reads that have, have, have made you change your thinking in terms of leadership or business? I think, I think on, the, on the leadership side, I, I will call out Simon Sinek's essentialism. Yeah, someone's actually. Um, um, that's a good one. That's really the kind of don't fret the small stuff, focus on what's important. Um, but it's it, it looks at it a different way on the on the engineering and product side. I, I, there's a book that I recommend to pretty much everybody, which is called Competing Against Luck by Clay Christensen. Um, it's the jobs to be done book, basically. Um, it teaches people customer first feature development and Brilliant. that it's 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 a great book. I think it should be required reading for anyone going into product management and highly recommended reading for anyone becoming an engineer awesome we'll certainly recommend that one what about um i guess from your perspective it will be interesting um to discuss around like next step and big plans what have you got on the agenda at content for you said the team's growing but what other exciting plans have you got over the next 12 months well, hopefully I'll start being able to travel again on the weekends and hey, during say. holidays. Um, hey, I, I think uh, I think the next thing, the, the big thing about where the world is going right now is it's all about digitization and making things digital. And if it's done right, this can really change the world for the better. If it's done wrong, it can not be so good. And as we read in the press about certain different things with big tech. But um, the one thing that's really interesting to me about this is that mm -hmm. you can really see how people's lives will change and not yeah. all jobs will be the same. Oh, yeah. But just like, you know, during the Industrial Revolution, when farmers were screaming, what am I going to do for a living? We got through that. I think there's going to be a lot of other things that digitization and automation change, but I think people are resilient enough that we'll figure out how to keep keep busy and how to keep moving forward. Whilst we're on that point, then I think it'd be interesting to talk about like anything around that grassroots level that you've seen. Obviously, working in um, 
the Bay and then moving across to Berlin. Is there any initiatives that you've seen that you really helped talent at a grassroots level and help encourage people into tech? Um, I think there needs to be more. Um, I think, you know, I, I remember having a conversation. I started having this conversation a few years ago when yeah. um, we started getting serious about the lack of women in engineering and how we have to fix that. Um, and I, I remember having a discussion with someone at VMware about how all the Silicon Valley companies just wanted to start reporting their percentage of women engineers. And yeah. if it went up, it's like, look, we're a percent higher than you, we're awesome. I'm like, okay, great, you moved the needle from 20% to 25%, that's not great. But if you really wanna fix this problem, you need to really talk to girls when they're young and get them interested in STEM programs in high school and college, and then you'll have engineers a few years later. Mm -hmm. um, I think I've heard that one theory about why there's less women actually in software engineers now than there was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, um, was gaming, computer video games that turned women off from, from going into engineering. I don't know if I believe it. It's an interesting. Less now than before. I didn't know that. It is. It I've is. Never heard say that before. I, I was when I lived in the states. I was still active yeah. um, with the alumni group at my university, and the percentage yeah. of female female computer science graduates is going down, not up. Wow, that's shocking, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah, that's really crazy, isn't it, to hear? But also, as well, it's important to remember that tech. There's so many different aspects of tech rather than just engineering yeah. as well. And different avenues and routes into tech. Like you say, like a CS degree is awesome. And to get women into engineering, ultimately, we are going to have to explore that path. But also sort of like apprenticeship level or going yeah. in via these co-courses, which are amazing. Um, by offering different platforms and different avenues and different different roles within tech and see, speaking about the spectrum of different roles that we've got as well. But it's definitely interesting to hear from your perspective as a VP of engineering around that yeah. um, and the ways that we can help look into that. Is, is obviously no, I, 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 I do agree that, that there's, I mean, when people think about the career in tech, they think about a software engineer, but there are yeah. much more, right? There's product management, there's designers, UX experience people, right? There's all of And without these... all of it, we wouldn't have the products at the end of it. Yeah. There's so yeah. many different aspects. If we break it out down, it's, it's into the whole whole spectrum that we need everything to be able to create the products at the end of the day so that the customer can enjoy. It, which really, is, is least... it really is a team sport. It really is. Yeah, of course it is. Of course it is. And you know what? It's been fantastic having you on the podcast and hearing your uh, hearing your experiences and um and your leadership. I love the thing around like the faith and the trust because to me to me that's so important. Um, and hopefully, like you say, it, it, it's something you've got to give for granted as a leader. You've got to be able to go in from a trusting perspective and, until until others prove you. Whereas I think a lot of, along the way, a lot of leaders have kind of said in the past, people sort of prove their trust and their work and, in the team. But that just can't be done. That's not how things are going to be able to be. We're going to help improve productivity in the future and help create better cultures and better organisations. So do you know what, Jeff? It's been a pleasure having you on the podcast today. So thanks so much for spending your morning with me um, hopefully the weather will improve for you in berlin and i uh, can't wait to keep an eye on all the great things that you're looking that you're up to at contentful sounds like you're growing an amazing culture there so it's certainly one to watch and um yeah i'm going to enjoy speaking to you and keep an eye on you guys in the future well thanks i i enjoyed the conversation great if anyone wants to get in touch jeff is it best if they get in touch via linkedin or twitter linkedin linkedin's best yeah perfect okay yeah. well uh, if anyone wants to get in touch Hit up Jeff on uh, LinkedIn and uh, thanks for enjoying the Let's Talk Leadership podcast today. Thank you. Have a great day. We would like to thank all of our listeners for tuning in. It means a lot to us and we really appreciate your support.